questions that are being asked I'd like to mostly address, so this is my preference, is questions that affect how you walk. Questions about living this out. What he's always told me is, tell them that if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, they'll be where they're supposed to be. But you need a teacher to teach you what it is you need to be doing. All right, we'll begin with Shamish Steve Waffle. Okay, if I may, I have, I would like to share, there's two if possible, but the first one says, finish what we start. Talk about the importance of finishing in a timely manner, just because we have a lifetime to get our walk right with the Father, knowing we might not get there, doesn't mean our daily, weekly, and monthly progress shouldn't be noticeable. I mean, good comment, good, good point. Look, the thing, the thing of the matter is, and I've mentioned, I don't think I could do a whole teaching on this, but I've mentioned it a few times, a lot of us a mini teaching. We need to be motivated by our mortality. And when you hear about tragedies of people dying that you didn't expect to pass, that were young or something just tragic all of a sudden happened, nobody saw that coming, you didn't see it coming. What makes you so sure you're gonna see it coming when it's your time? and just that you're gonna have plenty of time to fix whatever you've been putting off fixing. Nobody knows how much time they have. Nobody, okay? And so you may have more time than you think, you may have less time than you think, but you need to, as they say, redeem the time. You need to take care of now and not waste the time. Because the only time that you have is now. The past doesn't exist, the future may or may not exist for you. Well, I mean exist, meaning you being in it until like the kingdom, but what I'm saying is, who knows how much time, but you, you, will, you will at some point not have any more time. That time will reach its limit, and the, the bell's gonna ring, so to speak, time up, and you'll be thinking, oh, but, but I, you know, no. You need to try to go to bed every night satisfied that you put in the effort, that you did what you needed to do today to become as much more in the direction of becoming him as you could. Every day, every day, because you just don't know. Look, I, I intend to be here till I'm 150 still teaching you. Will he let me do that? I don't know. Will he come before that? I don't know. But I'm not going to count on any of those thoughts. I gotta do, that's why I throw it out there with as much, I mean, emotional um, seriousness as I can, because I don't want to, I don't want to have missed reaching you with enough seriousness just because I, you know, I might have been afraid, which I never am, but I mean, the teachers might be afraid of hurting your feelings or coming across. To, look, there's no game playing. When your child is at risk of getting hurt, you get really strong and in their face. Now, don't you? If they're doing stuff that you know is really not safe for them and they're not listening, don't you grab a hold of that? You need to listen to me. You're going to get hurt. This is, this is bad. This is dangerous. That's what I try to do with you guys every week. Because you're at danger of not getting in. We're not Christians here. We're not thinking that it's the one saved, always saved, they got my golden ticket. We are Israelites in an Exodus 19 covenant with Messiah Yeshua at the head. Okay? We understand that when he told them go in the land, he expected them go and do what I told you to do. The covenant, he says, we do. That's it, right? You agree to do everything that comes out of his mouth. Are we really putting that effort in? You said you had a second one. Yeah, just real quick. Uh, counsel different than what's spoken from the mic, because I think you should talk about how there's many adjustments and in instruction when we counsel with you that what we hear from the mic might be different because of our circumstances and the individual lives that we share, that we want. Okay, I wanna make sure that we are clear that it's not hypocrisy or changing of what I say from the mic. Just realize that when I'm in the mic and I'm up here in front of all of you, I have to say what will hit most of you the best I can hit generally. But when you're sitting in front of me in council, then it will be packaged very specifically to your situation. So the global paintbrush that I used up here may not be exactly what you need when we're one-on-one. -on -one. So it's not gonna be different counsel, it just might be a different tool being used and a different way of presenting it 
because of your specific situation and needs, okay? So there isn't any double standard or something different from here. They're both exactly the same, but you know what, my going like this up here, when I'm sitting with you, might be a whole lot more like this because that may be what you need more of. And we may talk just no louder than this the whole time. There's no hypocrisy in that. It's an adjusting to the situation and what that, what that situation awareness is an appropriateness to that dynamic, okay? So I just want to make sure that's clear. All right, Janet. You allow me to, like you allow someone? Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All of a so sudden, we... I feel like Noah. Everybody's coming two by two. It's two questions by two questions. So I'm on Matthew 6, 22 through 22, 23, right? When it's talking about the lamp of the body is the eye. So if therefore you are, your eyes are good, all your body shall be enlightened. But if your eyes are evil, all your body shall be darkened, and so on. So um, a, a couple of years ago, I remember when I heard from uh, one of a Jewish teacher who said that the, uh, the evil eye was related to envy. And so is that what this passage is about? Like, is this connected to the 10th commandment, like coveting, and from there, you, you've, you've told us that from there, all the other sins uh, start to come out. Can you help me with that? Please? All right, so chapter six. Now, first of all, I'm 99% sure. Where's Mark? I should ask Mark. If we, did I cover this in darkness and light? Didn't I cover this section? Because I know you listen to that teaching a lot of times. Okay, so good. Okay, so it's definitely in the darkness and light teaching, but I'm going to explain it here. Look at the context. He starts off in um, verse 19, do not lay up for yourself treasures. So it's about thinking of things as, tr as treasures and laying up these treasures. And then he eventually goes, where your treasure is, there your heart is. Then he talks about your focus, which is your eye. What are you looking at? What are you desiring? What is, because the eye sees and desires or sees and doesn't want. Because all of your I want, I don't want comes out of you're aware of something. Usually, unless you're blind, I mean, the people that are blind are doing it through sound or something, but they become aware of something, and then they either want it or they don't want it. And it says, if your eye is always jealous and desiring and envying other people's stuff, if that's what you, you're wanting when you're aware of something, you, you're not satisfied with what you have, because you want these treasures here now and you're trying to pile them up, that's a problem. It says, but if your eye is good, Go listen to the well done, good and trustworthy servant. The first teaching is on good. Good scripturally is there's none good but one. So the things of Yah are those things that are good. And if you're, you're focused and you're seeing through what the things are of Yah, then the light that is within is going to be great. Okay? But if the light that is within you is darkness, how great is the darkness going to be? In other words, if the thing lighting you, illuminating from the inside, if the thing that is what you're focusing on and what you're seeing, well, if you focus on light, you're going to get light. If you focus on darkness, you're going to get darkness. Okay? Thank you, Robert. That's you're great. Welcome. And the second question has to do with, you know, you keep encouraging us to become like him. So one of the things that he is... It's whatever he says he does, right? He's very, he has integrity, you know, his word has value, and he always, he never passes. So with that, when I was looking at the fruits of the spirit, and I was looking at self-control, is that the one that relates mostly with following through with what we say we're going, we're supposed to do? with the self-control, or is there any other fruit of the spirit that relates well, to Well, I think aspect? that it, it combines. I mean, self-control definitely is a big part of our follow-through and our getting things done, but also trustworthiness, okay? Because can I trust you to finish what you start? Can I trust you to get your task done? So there's a combination of a few of the aspects of the fruit that would be a part of that. The, the main thing is, is that, let's understand, Yahweh is very clear in Scripture about everything he expects you to do and not do. There are things that he says that are still written in flowery, sort of more poetic language that you don't maybe understand. But all those things that he expects you to do and not do, he's not, you know, beating around the bush about it. He's very clear and straightforward. He says, this is what I want you to do, how I want you to do it, where I want you to do it, when I want you to do it, et cetera. And that's got to be clear, all right? And so let's, let's understand that. I don't know if this is the right time to mention this, but it was something I was going to bring up, and somehow it just came to my head, so I'll mention it now. We, how do I want to put this? 
Okay, we have a susceptibility and a challenge that when we go out, usually on YouTube or somewhere like that, looking for various teachings on different things, is that, and I've listened to a lot of stuff. I always listen to a lot of stuff, just to hear what other teachers are doing and get a sense of where they're at and that kind of thing. And there's a lot of them out there that will say some very impressive sounding things that are completely not true, but they sound well, well read and they sound like they make sense and they sound correct. And so you need, you need to know that you have a potential to get tripped up if you don't have enough information to know when what they sound, said that sounded so impressive actually may not be true. But they package it together so well and they use the Hebrew and they did this other thing and yet it's still not correct. And so just be aware of that and be careful with that. Because I listened to, to this guy the other day. I said, wow, that was really well said. Very well, but it was completely not true. Okay? It was just not, it was wrong the way he pieced it together. But it sounded good. And a lot of people, I'm sure, would have thought it was great. And just, you gotta have to be really careful with that stuff, which is why you need a teacher. Okay? Not any teacher, one that's your teacher. Ephesians 4, teacher. And that way you can listen to other teachings if that's something you choose to do, but anything that's said, you can always run it by your teacher before you just sort of buy into it hook, line, and sinker, okay? Be just be really careful with that. I mean, I watched a whole teaching recently on one of the fairly bigger ministries that all of you probably would know on, on tithing and basically making the case that you can't do it today. It's only for Levites, really? Then was Melchizedek a Levite? Why was Abram tithing to Melchizedek? See, that, but they just ignore those things. And then, but they put this whole thing together and the person that doesn't want to tithe is going to watch it going, see, I knew I didn't need to do this. You know, because they linked it only to the Levites and the temple and the land. Well, when Abram gave his tithe and when Jacob gave his tithe, there was no living in the land, there was no temple and there was no Levites. And so clearly tithing is not only linked to now, at the time of the Levites, they were the ones that were given it. Prior, it was given to the Melchizedekians. Because we know that Noah gave, I mean, Abram gave, and then we know that Jacob said that he would give. He said to Yahweh, if you get me through all of this, and I, I'm going to give a tenth, I'm going to give my tithe. Who do you give it to? From the Jewish understanding, he gave it to Shem. Shem was still around. Shem... You know, they were still living a pretty long time before you get to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, and Shem certainly was old enough he could have been at all three of those, the weddings easily. Okay? And so let's just keep in mind that there are teachings out there that you, you need to have that discernment because you can listen and say, oh, that makes a whole lot of sense because they put it together so well. And it could still be wrong. All right. Some of you heard some really great, well put together teachings when you were in Christianity, only to find out later they were wrong. But they were very good at speaking and they were very good at their verses and they sounded very well read and very well trained and just be careful. Okay, because I'm listening to stuff right now. I'm thinking, man, if I wasn't who I am with my understandings, what would I think having just watched that? Would I be more solidly on the right footing or would I be kind of knocked off balance and heading in the wrong direction. So it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. All right, Ashley. Shalom, Rabbi. Shalom. Um, I have two questions as well, okay. of course. Um, my first one is, and I'm hoping I'm not going to sound like a silly person when I ask this, but Judgment Day, um, it seems to be conflicting with something else I heard. Is Judgment Day, is that when we're just going to, whatever you said, or is, are we going to be like in line? Okay, there's, there's nothing in scripture that tells us what judgment day is gonna look like in terms of the process of getting lined up and getting and sitting before the judge or anything like that. What we are told is, as a concept, is that everybody will stand before the judge and be evaluated as to whether or not you get in or not. In other words, does he, he's gonna look at you and say, do I wanna spend forever with you? And he's told us in scripture that the type of person he's looking for to spend forever with is someone like his son. That's the only one we know for sure he wants to spend forever with. And so what is, what is Yeshua? Yeshua is perfect in his Torah observance and submission, and he walks in the fruit. And so judgment is simply where you're going to find out 
what you did, you're going to be held accountable for all the choices that you made. And ultimately, he's, it's really about can he trust you with forever? Have you demonstrated the last fruit of the Ruach, that trustworthiness, with forever? Can he trust you to stay and maintain your commitment to covenant with him in a forever context? And you have this finite life, this fleshly life, to prove those things to him. And that's how serious this is. This is not what you were told on Sunday in church. And you all know that stuff never made any sense anyway. It was way too easy peasy, greasy grace, whatever you call it. I mean, it's just way too anything goes and everybody gets in and that doesn't make any sense. Or somehow you are no longer going to be you because he was going to fix all those things and turn you into some other thing. I am absolutely confident he wants you because you're you. Now, he wants you to transform character-wise in a way that matches with him. But he wants you with all your wonderfully different, individual, unique nuances that makes everybody so interesting and different, right? So he picked you because you're you, and he wants you to be you. All right? That's why no two of you are very much exactly the same, similar in some ways, very different in other ways. And so let's just keep that in mind. So ultimately, then we come to what's called the judgment, which is where he's going to make a decision. Now, by the way, when he says that some of us are going to be changed in a twinkling, when did those people stand in front of the judge? You're always in front of the judge. You're always, because it says that when he comes, some will be changed in a twinkling. Well, where was the court case? Think about it, okay? Now, we do have verses say that we have an intercessor that's making intercession for us all the time. Guess what? We're always in court. You're always on the stand. Your whole life is always being observed. Big brother is watching you. Yeshua, that is. And your father in heaven is watching you as well. Because I don't see those people skipping something that everybody needs to do, but I don't see them doing anything that it says they're doing. So my Rational logic says it must be something that's going on always behind the scenes and not something where you formally necessarily sit there in front of the judge. Now, those who are not going to get in may get to sit in front of the judge and find out why. He may want to look you in the eye and tell you, this is because of your choices. Just so you know, before you end up in the fire, you did this. You chose this. That's maybe where we get the weeping and gnashing of teeth. When people realize that, no, I don't get to have it my way, get away with everything, what I want to do, that he really meant what he said. They, you saw the weeping and gnashing of teeth when they were told they can't go in the land. And then the brilliant geniuses tried to go in. <laughs> and boy, that didn't go well. And so there was more weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then he said, you're all going to die in the desert. And there was more weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so where does in your sort of more Christian, you know, mindset of eschatology and how things play out and how they work out, so why didn't he offer them in the desert a chance to simply repent and then they get to go in the land? Because there's a higher judgment on those in covenant. He's expecting you to trust him. And he said, you people are the first initial coming out of Egypt to start things and represent me. And this is how you're going to represent me. You're not representing me. I'm not going to put you out there and have you claim you represent me behaving like you're doing. That's why he threw them out of the land. He said, you're not going to sit here in front of everybody in the world watching you behave this way and say you are representing me. So hopefully that helps a little bit. All right, what else? Um, my second question is, when we get to the kingdom, um, wherever that is, and he changes us and takes away our imperfections and stuff like that. What happened, like my heart of hearing and deafness, what happened if I don't see that as an imperfection because I feel like I'm normal? Like, can we say, stay like this? No, he's going to, look, he'll, he'll fix anything that's broken that you can't fix yourself, okay? Well, you're not working as optimally designed by manufacturer standards, <laughs> okay? You are, for, you are finding ways to function under the disability, and that's great. But he's going to give you the blessing of having the beauty of hearing everything perfectly. 
And you'll get to hear things you can't even hear now in our limitations as human beings. There's, we only hear such a limited amount of the sound spectrum and only see a limited amount of the visual spectrum, right? The things that are, that are out there, okay? So we're all gonna be able to see all of that and hear all of that. It's, so not just you, all of us, our hearing is gonna be cleared up in a whole different way, okay? Now, the reason Ashley keeps saying wherever that is and whatever that is, she's so new at all this and she doesn't wanna say it wrong. So the way this is playing out, just so you understand at the end of the book, this is a little eschatology, is that we get to the end and then there's a new heaven and a new earth and the heavenly Jerusalem comes here. So it's all gonna happen here, but not here the way it is now. It'll be a new earth because the old one will have passed away. But all of that takes place here. The kingdom, the millennium, everything takes place here. Okay? All right. You're welcome. Okay, next. Shabbat shalom. All right, uh, William? Yes, from Waterford. Yep. Um, you're uh, teaching on evil. The last couple of uh, Sabbaths, you, uh, you were teaching on how our desires may lead us to be tempted. You were, I believe you were saying that. That our desires will definitely lead us to be tempted, yes. Right. Um, and, and we're taught in um, um, Hebrews 4.15 that Yeshua was uh, tempted in all ways as we are. So uh, I know if I was uh, in the wilderness for 40 days without food and water, I'd be feeling pretty depressed myself, you know, really depressed. So my, my question is in uh, Matthew 4, when Yeshua is tempted at, to jump from the high place, was that from the desire to be, be jumped? Did he have a, does, was he have a thought for at least a second or a feeling to, you know? All, all right, look, there's... there's um there's two levels to this. Mostly in your life, okay, you desire something and that's where there'll be a temptation or you see or you're aware of something and you decide whether or not you desire it. And if you desire it and it's something you shouldn't have, that might be a temptation. But in the Messiah Hasatan discussion, okay, it wasn't something he desired. It was Hasatan trying to see if there was a desire there that he could tempt. And he does that, Hasatan does that with you too, causing or allowing himself things to pop up in your life to see whether or not you'll be tempted by them. And then when you show yourself not, he leaves that area alone because there's nothing there to work with. He shows you are, he's gonna work on you with that all the time. And so there is a role that Hasatan has in there. But again, without the desire, Yeshua didn't have that desire, so the temptation wasn't really a temptation. Okay, Hasatan threw it out there to see what, if there was anything to work with, and he goes, because I know he did that to Job, and that's when he said that Job had nothing to work with. He said, I tried. The guy doesn't have anything to work with. Okay, does that help? Right, thanks for the distinction. Good, good. He said thanks for the distinction. He didn't have the mic, but just so he said that. All right, Esther, and then we're going to go to the live stream. Shalom, Rabbi. Shalom. I have a question about um, Second Tithe, and just because of the thought hit me today, so I thought I'd ask you. Um, at the end of the year, I understand like we're supposed to you know, put it in the box, reset the second tithe on Sukkot. Um, there's always so much to put in at because we can never use it, you know, during the feast as much as you, it just, just, there's abundance. Is that wrong to use like portions of it throughout the year to bring to, with you to the feast as an offering of your second no, no, tithe? No, no, you can do that. that. Okay. Do that. Okay, let me, let me kind of make this more clear with the second tithe. The second tithe is for you to be blessed and have abundance in observing the feasts. Theoretically, when I say theoretically, like the way things were done back in the days of Yeshua and before, the people brought these things to the feasts. So they had a tithe of that particular animals and crops and things that they'd been accumulating, which is why they would then make the confession that they had not messed with it, okay? And so they would have what they would bring and whatever they didn't use for their own enjoyment, they gave at the feast. And then they would do it again between that and the next feast. So they did this three times a year, all right? You did it on unleavened bread right at the beginning because you've been accumulating since Sukkot. Then you did it again at Shavuot because that, that was the bigger harvest than what you had at the beginning with unleavened bread. And then you brought it again and you waited till the end, not for trumpets, not for atonement, but for Sukkot to bring your tithe so you can enjoy this big feast. And then you would leave whatever excess there was there. In the realities of it, and I don't know if they did this, they might have, 
you don't always know if you're going to have a good crop. You don't always know, but sometimes you have a good bumper crop and you have plenty of abundance. So it would make sense to me that you would, since it's four feasts between unleavened bread and Sukkot every year, that you would hold on to some of it in case some adverse thing were to happen and so that you would have enough to get to each of those feasts. And then when you got to the end at Sukkot, because after all, there's a nice long time from Sukkot to unleavened bread to start all over again. So you get to Sukkot, whatever excess there was, you would just go ahead and put that as the offering. Now, bear in mind that this is also how the Levites got three reasonably large infusions of funding three times a year. Because people weren't coming every week and just putting money in a box like we do here at services or whatever it is. Because people didn't get paid weekly. People who were artisans got paid per project. So sometimes it took them a while to make, you know, something that they were baking either out of wood or maybe they had to go out there and get fish and bring them to market. But they only got paid as often as things were done. And so, or if you're a farmer, only when the crops came in and then you brought them to market. And so when you're looking at it from that point of view, you would use some wisdom to hold on to and utilize your second tithe appropriately, especially when you know economically things are not very good. Just like the seven years of abundance getting ready for the seven years of famine. Because you don't know when you might have a famine. And the way the world is going right now, sometimes you may be out of work. There may be things that may cause an adverse you know, financial situation for you. But then, so, what, so that's why then at the feasts, Look, there are people that did not come this week, could not make it, couldn't get here, couldn't travel, it was too far, whatever. And some of them took their, some of their second tithe and sent it as if they were coming just so they would be able to send it now as part of the feast. Knowing that they're still accumulating it for the next one, and if they don't come, they'll do the same thing. But that's where the Levites would get the larger infusions of fundings to do some of the bigger things that were ha having to be done those three times a year, okay? Those three times a year. And so uh, hopefully that answers the question, Esther, okay? All right, so all of you are to be encouraged that you should be doing the second tithe. It is for you, but the excess of it goes into the offering at the end. And it's a feast-related cycle. So it goes from unleavened bread to Sukkot. So it's not really a full year that way, but you start after Sukkot accumulating it all the way to unleavened bread, okay? But it's utilized between those two feasts. And then you start at zero again. And it's very important that you understand that and why. Because if you don't start at zero and you start having more and more excess, then you'll stop doing it because you won't need it. And he didn't say that you should ever stop doing it. And so you have to start off at zero again so that you will start doing it again each year, okay? All right, does that make sense? Good, all right. Shamus Rob on the live stream desk. Okay. From from Mary says, Rabbi, can you explain these two verses in Proverbs 26, verses four and five? It says, I understand it as not taking part in the folly of a fool and to let them know you won't take part in their folly. Is this correct? All right, Proverbs 26, verse four, do not answer a fool according to his folly lest you also become like him. Answer a fool according to his folly lest he become wise in his own eyes. Okay, so um, what he's trying to say is, look, if somebody, if a fool is asking you something in their folly, in other words, there's something that's completely just off, it doesn't really make it really clear if someone's just kidding or jesting, but that they're just in, a, in an off place, don't answer them according to their folly. In other words, don't get caught up into actually going and finding a way to encourage, support, or endorse whatever it is they were trying to do. But he says, answer a fool according to his folly, meaning, Answer it with the straight answer. Give them the straight answer, lest he become wise in his own eyes, thinking, see, I knew it, I was so smart and everything, but nobody ever said I was wrong. You got a lot of people out there that are really suffering because nobody's ever told them to knock it off or that they're wrong, okay? I've got some parents that I've had to counsel over the last 20 years that have adult children that are behaving the way they behave because the adult parent never told them that that's not a appropriate behavior. Not, a, not appropriate way to interact. And so they've enabled all of this. And so really Proverbs is trying to get you not to enable foolishness. So if someone's going in a foolish direction, don't participate in it, but address it directly so that they're not just walking around thinking they're so smart in their own eyes. All right, next question. 
Okay, Tom Lasardo, Leviticus 23, 17. Is there a meaning uh, for the two loaves of leavened bread on Shavuot? Okay, so what, what is the reason for the unleavened bread in the Exodus story in Passover? It's called the bread of affliction to remind them that they were leaving in haste and they were not celebrating in abundance. What's the Shavuot about? Celebrating the big harvest, the giving of the Torah, the receiving of the Ruach, all these things that are connected to Shavuot. So we use nice, delicious leavened bread as opposed to unleavened bread, which is not quite as delicious necessarily. I happen to like it, but not everybody does, okay? And so think about the connection, in other words, what it's being connected to. This is Shavuot, it's an abundance celebration. So you want that warm, hot, fluffy, you know, that delicious, you know, leavened bread, and then you've got the bread of affliction, okay? Which is to remind you that you came out of harshness and out of slavery and, and that you were left in a hurry and you didn't just have time to just, you know, make a giant feast, okay? Next. Okay, from, from BL says, is it ever acceptable for a wife to tell her husband what to do in a bossy way because she has issues with authority? I'm only making a smile because you guys are already laughing. <laughs> All right. It is never, let me make sure I put this right. It's never right for anybody to say anything in a bossy way. Because bossy way is the problem. Now, it is right for men, husbands, to maintain and interact with their spouses in an authoritative way. And there's a difference between maintaining authority and being bossy, okay? That, but it's never going to be right for the wife to treat the husband in a bossy way. But it's not right for anybody to do anything in a bossy way. But the problem is if you have problem with authority, then you need to work on that problem with authority. Well, you don't understand how bad my husband is at it. Well, then your husband needs help getting better at authority. Okay? You, you can't usurp authority under any circumstances, no matter where you are in a vertical. Every one of us is somewhere in that vertical, and you are never to usurp the above authority. So as a wife, you cannot usurp your husband's authority. Doesn't matter how bad he's doing at it. Let that be the person above him, the being above him, at least at the very minimum, Yeshua, to take care of dealing with his lack of ability. Pray for him. If it's bad enough, then you might need to leave, and that's your thing. But I'm just saying is, if you can get them to get counsel, we can get them to get counsel. But you cannot be right when you're acting wrong. Being bossy to a man, by the way, that will never, ever get you a result you want. Just... Let's just deal with it from that point of view. There is not a man that's ever been born that being bossy to him is gonna make everything fix. There is no way. And if there is a man, then he's not a man. And you do not want to be married to him. So if your bossiness would work, you would not be married to a guy you should actually want to be married to. Because then he would let you do that, which is terrible. I mean, it sounds like you're frustrated because the way you think he should be is not what you have. That doesn't mean you're right. I'm just saying is the way you think he should be is not happening in whatever area. Maybe you're right, maybe you're not, but the way you're handling it is not right. Okay? But notice I also said it's not right for the men to be bossy to their wives. Wield your authority with respect, with awe and reverence, with caution, but do wield your authority where needed because it is your job to wield authority. But understand that authority is a serving position. It's also a very much for the man, a provide and protect position. All right? You can ask my wife. I've said this famously a million times. I almost always say yes to everything, knowing full well that she knows that if I ever say no, I don't want an argument because I'm only going to say no if it's necessary. Okay? Because I'm going to wield that authority only when it's necessary. Not because I just prefer something or this or that. I try to not prefer anything. I don't want to make everything be, I'm the boss, we do it my way. That's bossy. I'm only going to wield that authority where needed. 
because something unsafe is going to happen or a problem with providing or, or something unwise and say, no, I don't think we need to do that. Or maybe we don't just need to do that right now. We could do it later or something. Okay? But that's not bossy. Be very careful how you wield authority. And it's very important that you do. Okay, everybody has people that they're serving in a, in a position of authority. Wield that authority very cautiously. But be respectful. Don't just blast people. We have a few people that every now and then they, they just go over and get in somebody's face and they're not understanding. You've got to be careful. You have authority how you wield that. And some people think, amen to that, Rabbi. Are you listening to yourself? <laughs> but when the authority comes back at you in a way that you don't like, you may want to ask yourself if you did something to bring that on as opposed to just an inappropriate use of authority. You might have been usurping. You may have been disrespectful. You may have needed somebody to crack down on you at that moment and say, hey, knock that off. That's not the way this works. Okay? And, and again, that would be an appropriate use of authority if done in the right situation correctly, okay? But to answer the question again, nobody should be acting bossy. Yeshua doesn't act bossy. The Father doesn't act bossy. Okay? Don't, nobody wants a boss. Women should want a husband who can be the master of their house and be trusted to lead and rule and reign in that house in a benevolent, a benevolent way, providing and protecting that family. Okay? You should want the type of king that's coming. So the man should be the king in the house, but he shouldn't be the, the abusive overlord in the house or the tyrant in the house, but the protector. All right. Which means all you men as protectors, it doesn't necessarily matter, you know, the arrangement of the, of the things in your cabinets, in your kitchen, or, you know, whether or not there was two or three extra dishes in the sink or anything. These are not matters of protection. You don't have to have a meltdown if something did or didn't get done that you would have preferred to get done or didn't get done. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't ask and say, look, I would, this is the way I would like things to be. You are, after all, the head. But recognize that the person that you're the head of also has their stuff and their issues and their struggles. And you have to be in that kind of a leadership position where you recognize all that. And so you can ask my wife, I demand very little. I don't know if you would believe that because you know me from the microphone, but I really, and you can ask Uncle Bob who's been in my house more than anybody. I'm easy going, okay? But I put my foot down those very few times where I say, this is not a good idea right now, or we don't need to do this at all. And by the way, that's not always easy. You know, not, nothing negative on my wife, but you know what? You get all those yeses, it's hard to get a no sometimes. Because then you get so used to hearing the yeses. Ladies, sometimes you struggle, not because of any other reason, but the husband spoiled you. Because some of you have husbands who give you a lot of yeses. And then they finally give you a no, and you look at them like, what? <laughs> what do you mean, no? Remember I told you about the hundred yeses? See, my deal with my wife was, I will give you those hundred yeses. And that's just an arbitrary big number, because I give her probably a whole lot more than that most of the time. But you, under the one condition... I'm happy to give you the yeses if you do not argue with a no. Okay? That's the deal we made. I have to remind sometimes, say, look, remember the deal was that we don't argue with the no's. You get all these yeses, because if we're going to start arguing with the no's, we're not going to have the yeses. But guys, don't say no so much. Don't get involved so much. Be a blessing to them. Okay? All right. Yeah. Gentlemen, my wife walks in the living room and I'm watching stuff. Generally speaking, I will offer her the remote so she can watch what she wants. <gasps> a man offering up a remote? Sure. Unless I'm watching the news and something big just happened. Like, for example, when the Ukraine thing just happened, I said, no, I need to watch this right now. Okay? But as long as it's just the normal noise of the news or noise or whatever, and she walks in, I'm just like, here you go. I want to bless her. I only want to step in when it's important. All right? Watching the TV is never important. Well, I shouldn't say that. That news event was important. Okay? But it's rarely important. Where we go to eat. 
I don't care most of the time. Okay? Because I'm about providing. What do you guys want? I ask the children, I ask the wife, let, let them, whatever you guys want. I don't, you know, I'll adjust. I don't, it's about providing, right? So hopefully that helped in some way. All right, Rob? Okay, from Ryan Evans, since we are to consider the fact that only two men from the first generation in Exodus were able to enter the promised land, what is the takeaway that Moses was not able? Any prophet, is there any prophetic significance? Well, the, the significance, and I've said this in the, um, every time we do those Torah portions, Moses not going in shows that Yahweh is consistent. Number one, he, he didn't listen, he broke the rules. And number two, the higher judgment standard on a leader. He had already told the others who, who did not go in when they were supposed to go in, you're not getting to go in. That was for what? Disobedience, not trusting. Well, Moses was in a higher position of expectation with Yahweh as a leader. And when he popped his cork and struck the rock, and did not represent Yah the right way, Yahweh said, I'm sorry, you don't get to go in. Okay? Matter of fact, he told him, don't you argue with me about this, because he said, hey, you know, he's like, uh-uh, we're not gonna talk about this. I said, no, that's no. And so that's what Moses said, so for your sakes, you know, he wasn't gonna let me say anything, and I, that was it. Because otherwise, Yah changes his position, his mind, his consequences, and he doesn't. Okay, next. Arthur and Linda Nakanichni says that Luke 13, verses six through nine, would this be the correct understanding? Uh, the, a certain man would be the father, the gardener was Yeshua, and the fig tree is the called out one. All right, let's see what it says here. And he spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the gardener, look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why does it even make the ground useless? Why does it even make, okay. And he answering said to him, Master, leave it the, this year too until I d um, dig around it and throw manure. And if indeed it bears fruit, good. But if not so, you shall cut it down. Okay, so I don't know that we necessarily want to just go to name specifics that this is Yeshua, this is the Father, etc. But what he's trying to say is, look, okay, if we're going to look at it from John 15, it talks about the vineyard and the gardener and stuff. Okay, we say, okay, so we have a certain man has a fig tree planted in a vineyard. Okay, so we have a vineyard. The vineyard is the, the land. In other words, the, the covenanted soil, like the good dirt versus bad dirt, like the parable of the sower, the seed. And he's seeking fruit. So he's called you, he's planted you, and he's looking for fruit. And he says, look, it's been three years and I don't see any fruit. Cut it down. And so maybe now this is Yeshua intervening and intercessing, saying, Master, leave it for a year. Let me work on it. Okay? And let me, let me just explain something that maybe you're not going to like. Sometimes Yeshua to work on you is going to throw a lot of manure on you. You're going to find yourself deep in manure. Some deep stuff. So that you can bear some fruit. Maybe you never got that out of that before. Isn't that what it says? He says, Master, leave it until I dig around it and throw manure. So it says, I'm going to start digging around and clearing out all of the things around out of that person's life, and I'm going to throw a whole bunch of stuff. Now, of course, manure also is what? All of the minerals and all of the other things that are necessary for something to grow. So I'm also going to throw all this good stuff over there, but I'm going to dig around and clear out all the noise. The thorns, the brambles, the other weeds and everything else that could choke out the tree. See, think about it with you. When I teach you, what am I trying to do all the time? Get you to put all that other stuff away, put things down, stop listening to all the noise out there that you're listening to, and allow yourself to get fed and receive so that you can bear fruit. Okay? Of course, there are those that think that I'm just throwing manure, but that's okay. All right, next. Okay, from Bruno O says, is it 
possible for a person to have Yah's spirit and yet not be, quote unquote, born again? Hmm. And the only reason I'm saying that is because you're using terms that I'm sure we're not going to be using the same lexicon for those terms. Okay? These are some of the biggest challenges we have as a covenanted body, as we're becoming a covenanted body, and the teachers in the body, is that we use terms that we don't all use the same. So when someone says, having Yah's spirit, maybe we don't all mean the same thing when we say that. Certainly with born again, we don't. Okay? And so then we start asking the question and we're trying to compare two terms that we probably aren't using the same way anyway. The way I would describe it is this. When he pops your bubble, in other words, he taps you on the shoulder, opens your eyes and your ears, and you start to see that the world is not the way you thought it was. And that the relationship vertically is not the way you thought it was. And the expectations vertically is not the way you thought it was. You see something's wrong, something's missing, all kinds of stuff is confusion. Doesn't make any sense. And then through that moment, you start asking, seeking, and knocking. And then through the asking, seeking, and knocking, you find him, the real him. Not what you were taught all the way along, but the real father and son. Not the costumed, non accurate, you know, the, that the church has given you for all these years, and most messianic groups give you. And you find him. And then through covenant, you receive his spirit. His spirit is what spirit? Not Pentecostalism and all this other stuff. His spirit is the spirit of Torah, of truth, of Yeshua, the spirit of truth. And as you receive that spirit, you then choose being born again. In other words, to go and mikvah, put the old man in the grave and come out a new person. Okay, so that's how they're actually connected. So when someone says it's impossible to receive the, you know, the spirit of Yah and not be born again, I think that you don't understand the terms because they think they're connected. Because you receive his spirit, you choose to be born again. And I don't mean born again the way the Christians use it, which is why you almost never hear me use that term. You don't hear me talk about being saved. You don't hear me talk about being born again because these are terms that are just being bandied about and they don't mean scripturally correctly by the way that people are using them. They're not using them the way the scripture does. And so born again, when Yeshua was talking about it, is really talking about when we are born of the, you know, in the, in the resurrection, when we're born of the incorruptible. And go listen to the little in focus I did called, I don't know, messing with Nicodemus or doing something with Nicodemus. <laughs> picking on, picking on Nicodemus. Because that's where the whole born again thing comes up. And I bring you to the verses in the Old Testament that that refers to. And so through the process of being called, you receive the Ruach. Remember, there's a whole process of him giving you information, but you have to receive it. And so he calls you, you then have to respond to the calling. And when you respond through that process, you will receive the Ruach. In other words, you'll start focusing on the spirit of the intent of what he always had in mind that you didn't understand before. And in that, you are no longer going to be the old you. You'll be born again but not out of your mother's womb, which is the Nicodemus conversation, but you'll choose to live a different life than you had been living before. You'll still be you, but you'll be making a whole lot of choices that are just different this time than before. So hopefully that answers the question. Okay, Rob, one more and then we'll come back out here. Okay, from, from Tammy Filson says, I was wondering if Christian music is okay for listening to and worshiping the Father. Okay. Very common question. The answer is, well, let me give you the format for you figuring out the answer. Music has lyrics. So basically when you, and a lot of you learn even more from music than you realize because you're just repeating lyrics all the time. You know, Matthew, so how many of you have like repeated lyrics of songs and only did not realize what you were actually even saying? Okay. Like you knew the words you were saying, so it wasn't like you were speaking in tongues or something. 
but you're singing along and singing along, and it never occurred to you what the lyrics were really actually saying. So one day you read the lyrics and you're like, oh no. <laughs> That's what they were saying? <laughs> Because you're just caught up and you're singing along and right, you got the, that old bounce in your step going and you don't realize, what am I singing? Christian music, any religious music, is meant to be instructional. And so I wouldn't be listening to any music that the instruction they're trying to instruct me in is not grounded in truth correctly. So no. I would not be listening to and do not listen to Christian music. We did used to have some Christian songs that we had in our playlist here at the congregation over the years that we thought, okay, we'll just change the little things that we don't like and fix them. But that's, you know what? There's a second aspect to this. Those songs also bring you back to the place where you used to hear them. And you don't need to go back there. Most of you I know don't, definitely don't want to go back there. Now, if you like to hear a lot of that stuff, there's a group down the road you go listen to and they sing that all day long, okay? If that's what you want. But we don't. Matter of fact, there was a song that we've been doing for Shavuot a couple years in a row that I really liked the song, but it's from a Christian album, from a Christian movie thing, whatever, whatever it was from, and we just decided we're not using it anymore, okay? And so we are trying to purge all those things out. And to my um, delight, you know, I have a beautiful daughter that has written some tremendous songs and keeps writing songs, and we've got more that are coming, okay? And, and we even sang some today, and we'll be singing some tomorrow. And so it's, it's just fantastic that we can do these things, but also to realize, I know it's hard and it's sad because some of these songs are so well written, they're very powerful. I'm talking about the Christian ones, but we, you know where it's coming from and where it's trying to produce. We know the fruit it's trying to produce. And you don't want to be that fruit. You don't want it being produced in you. So no. <laughs> but I wanted to give you the thought process behind it first. Okay, William, round two. Um, you, excuse me. You probably talked on this before, but I've forgotten. Um, concerning second tithes, I've decided to stay until Wednesday so I can be here for Torah study. Mm -hmm. Can I use part of my second tithe for the next couple of days for Monday and Tuesday uh, hotels and stuff? As part of your kind of like extended celebration? Yeah. I would say you could do that. Okay, thank you. And the, reason, and the reason being that because, again, when people would go to the feast, they would use that tithe for the travel to the feast, which could have taken them a couple of days if they lived far enough away back in Israel's time, right? And the same thing going back home. The second tithe would have been to offset those expenses. So, yes. Okay? Now, only because he said a day or two after. I mean, he's not, if he's talking about, like, next week and staying for two, then I would have said no. Okay? But he's, he's just having an extended long week here with our celebration. That's fine. All right, Kristen. Okay. Um, I don't know if I'm going to explain this very well, but um, I live with my family, um, my daughter and her husband and their kids, and they are not in this walk, but I, for Christmas time, this is a Christmas question, um, the kids are uh, very excited about Christmas. They all know I don't celebrate it. And they do pretty well about not getting me involved in everything. And I, of course, don't involve myself in anything there. Except when they want to show me a song they learned on the piano. And they say, Grandma, come on over and, you know, listen to this song. And I, innocently, I sit down and I go, oh, okay, great, Let's play a song, you know. And, and I should understand that it's probably going to be a Christmas song. But, so I sit there and they start playing. It's like, oh, and now I have to listen to it. And when they finish, I, of course, want to praise them because they did a good job. So how do I handle this better? I feel like I just, I mean, should I just be more aware and just kind of, I, I don't want to just ignore my family during the season because I live with them, you know? So how do I? It's not easy. I mean, it's, I understand, and I'm sure a lot of people feel your struggle with that. I mean, because we all, we all struggle if we have family and have to spend a lot of time around them. Um, it's good that you make it clear what you will and won't participate in so that they're aware of that. And the consistency of maintaining that 
is the key to it actually getting easier over time because they will eventually start to realize you're not playing games and you're not going to change. In the beginning, they're going to push at you as hard as they can, thinking they might actually get to win. At some point, they'll realize they're not going to, and then they'll, they'll either get more quiet with you or they'll just leave you alone to whatever degree. But as far as, you know, this is a very challenging thing. You're a grandparent. You're, the children want to play a song. Do, do they learn other things and, and, and have other opportunities to play other stuff for you? Then you have to just explain to them, as, especially as they start getting old enough, to say, look, Grandma doesn't do this stuff. I'd love to hear you play. When you learn other songs, come and play them for me. I just would prefer not to do the Christmas stuff. And as they get older, they'll understand it more, okay? Because they get the first thing, like, I don't understand. What's it? But, you know, how old are they now? Four, six, and ten. Certainly the six and the ten can start to understand it. The ten for sure. Just start saying, look, Grandma loves to hear you play. I just, I don't do this Christmas stuff, so can we just not do that? Okay? All right. Now, once you've sat there and you've had to sit through it and you got sort of tricked into it or whatever it is, then I don't have a problem with you praising the child for their playing and everything else. I wouldn't sing along with the song or anything, but... <laughs> Which you might catch yourself doing if you were raised with that stuff and be like, oh my gosh, I caught myself, I'm singing along. But the children can handle this much better than the parents a lot of the time. I had parents all say, oh, well, but you know, we still do the Christmas thing for the kids. I've spoken to so many parents that have stopped. The kids handle it better than the parents. Okay, the kids do not have this problem. I got in a pretty strong debate, we'll call it, with Messianic leadership in Australia that I was visiting, not part of our you know, ministry, but a group that was familiar with me wanted me to speak there. And we really banged it out pretty good over giving presents during Hanukkah. And they were saying about the children, the children, I said, that's nonsense. The children will be fine, it's you. And they didn't like, and I, I was like, look, I'm only the rabbi, you invited me as a guest, do what you want, but if you're under my authority, I'd be telling you, just knock it off, you're wrong. Then they said, but, because they were very rabbinic in their background, oh, but even the Orthodox rabbis now are telling everybody to give presents on, on Hanukkah. I said, well, that's stupid. Okay, that's foolishness and that's wrong. And the Hanukkah present thing only started in the 1960s in America. So it's not even an old tradition. It was to compete with Christmas. What I'm just saying is the parents don't realize how well the children will actually handle this. They really won't handle it like, with any problem. They really don't. Okay? It's you feeding into it that makes it bad. Because you love the thing and the taking care of them and the giving and all that. And so when you're interacting with the grandkids, they'll handle it just fine. Okay? Especially if you catch them right at the beginning and, they, and you're consistent with it, they'll handle it just fine. Yeah.